Welcome back to the Frontier of Finance. I'm your host, James Rockwood, here with Rob Cernkovic. And we've got Janet Lee, who's an Executive Vice President and National Sales Manager for the Pacific Financial Group. Um, Janet's here to talk about self-directed brokerage accounts in retirement. Um, we're super excited to have you on. Thanks for joining us, Janet. Thank you for having me. I'm super excited to be here. I think we like to start with a bit of a background. So tell me, how did you get into this space? Where did you start your career? Um, and uh, what brought you into the self-directed brokerage account in retirement space business? Sure. I started off my career uh, actually on the institutional side of the world, doing equity research and institutional sales. And really, that's kind of where I got my feet wet in terms of financial services and financial planning. And over time, I realized that the institutional world is not quite where I wanted to be <laughs> for a variety of reasons, mostly because uh, my morning started at 4.30 with our morning <laughs> meetings. I and uh, I really wanted to help individual investors. And I thought where my impact could be best felt is working on the retail side. I've been with the Pacific Financial Group for 15 years, and it's been a true privilege and a pleasure to be part of its growth. When we started, or when I started 15 years ago, we had about 200 million under assets. I joined uh, at just the right time, August 2008, which is when the markets took a nosedive. <laughs> but it really made us look at our business and how do we improve our business? How do we innovate? How do we meet the market where it needs to be met? And 15 years later, uh, we're now at about three and a half billion in assets under management. And so it's been a fun journey, one that I feel very privileged to be a part of. That's amazing. That's great growth that you've experienced over that period of time. I think, I think the thing that um, is kind of obvious question, I'll go, <laughs> go right. I was like, what's a self-directed brokerage account in retirement? And um, is it, is it um, what that is specifically that allowed you to grow so fast? Or was it specific to the um, Pacific Financial Group, something that you're doing unique? Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah. Absolutely. So a self-directed brokerage account option, and I'm just going to call it an SDBA okay. going forward to simplify all of our lives here. And uh, another very commonly used uh, description of a self-directed brokerage account option is a brokerage window. But what it is, is simply just another investment option that's available on many employer-sponsored retirement plans. And while looking at an investment option for a 401k, a 403b, or a 457, you'll typically see about 10 to 20 preset investment options, typically a handful of equity or fixed income mutual funds and a handful of target date funds. And oftentimes you'll see something called an SDBA. And again, an SDBA is simply just another investment option, but it's a really powerful one because what it does is it opens up access to thousands of other investment options, including individual stocks, bonds, ETFs, and mutual funds. But the most important option that it opens up is the ability for the participant to now work with their financial advisor on what is arguably their largest asset going into retirement. So that's something that we're really excited about and absolutely has been part of our growth. Uh, the SDBA has been part of our story for a very long time. With the Pension Protection Act that passed in 2006, it really elevated the option of an SDBA to more prominence and gained a lot more awareness because of the Pension Protection Act. And certainly that's been part of our story and something that we're really proud of. Is building awareness still something you need to do around it? Or is it something that, that folks you know, readily know about and advisors readily know about? Awareness is probably the biggest reason why we don't see more utilization yeah. in SDBA. And I think it pr presents a tremendous growth opportunity, not just for clients and in terms of their retirement and preparing and sure. saving for retirement, but for advisors to get involved with their clients' assets while they're still working, while they're still contributing, and without being the rep on the plan. The awareness around SDBA, typically for a participant when they enroll in their 401k, they pick out a couple of choices and then they really don't look at it again. Most people spend more time planning for their summer vacations mm -hmm. on an annual basis than they do looking at their 401k. And so it's not surprising that the utilization rates remain so low. I think when people look at their investment menu, they may or may not notice an SDBA option. But even if they see it, they think, what is that? And what, I, what am I supposed to do with it? 
And that's where working with a financial advisor is really critical to raising the awareness because an advisor can say, this is what an SDBA is, and here's what that means to you. You can now start working with me, and I've partnered with the Pacific Financial Group to provide you with a customized experience that is tailored to your unique investment objectives and your unique risk tolerance. So you say they're underutilized. Like, can you quantify that for us? How many people in like a percent are, are using um, that are in these 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 plans are using the SDBA option? Sure. So we estimate that about forty percent of all retirement plans now offer an SDBA option. But of that forty percent, the utilization rate is at around three to four percent. Mm. So it's quite low. But again, I think that. Pres- presents a tremendous opportunity for clients to start getting more active help on their retirement accounts and for advisors to get involved today when clients need help the most. Uh, Clients don't need help when it's time for retirement. They need assistance years in advance. And I love that the SDBA option gives them that option to get involved with their clients' assets when it matters the most. So was the Pacific Group um, a bit of a trailblazer in this space? And um, is there kind of a story behind how SDBA became a focal point? Yes. And thank you for asking that question. (laughs) We are absolutely trailblazers. (laughs) No, but we do like to consider ourselves pioneers in the space. We have always been and we will continue to be innovators. Our CEO, Megan Mead, when she started off at the Pacific Financial Group, she was working with smaller retirement plans, specifically with law firms. And these law firms, over time, they were lifted away by promises of zero fees, which they quickly realized was not true. And they went back to Megan and they said, we'd like to work with you again. We want your customized help. And we know that we do better when we work with you. And so it was because they came back and said, let's explore the self-directed brokerage account option and how that means we can engage with you again. So that was the genesis of our journey. And since then, we've continued to innovate. Uh, Innovation is very much core to what we believe. We are founded and continue to invest into the hope and the goal of providing for better investor outcomes. And part of that is continuous innovation. Several years ago, we managed our own assets and we loved doing it and experienced a tremendous amount of success. And over time, what we saw is some of the largest asset managers taking a look at us and saying, hey, we'd like to come alongside you in this journey. That's cool. Yeah, so cool. And we feel very proud that six of the 14 largest asset managers on this planet have said we want to be a part of your journey. And we are proud that we can bring a turnkey asset management platform inside of a self-directed brokerage account so that we can provide an elevated and more customized experience to clients and to advisors. Has that been material in like awareness and conversion of, of folks having those um, large brands as partners? Yeah, I absolutely think that brand awareness is really important to not just the acceptance of it, yeah. but the wider adoption of it. Some of the strategists that we've partnered with are household names that we hear about every single day. And so for our platform and really raising the awareness, it really helps to have some of these larger asset managers take a look at us and trust us and have the confidence in us to partner with us. And so it's been very much a big part of our story and something that we're very proud of. When you talk about awareness, how much do you think of that is on advisors, if there's a huge amount of assets they can potentially help their own clients with um, that they aren't? How do you, is it the fact that when you, when you go down, you, you don't click the SDBA button that you're kind of down that path now and you can't go back? Um, is it just something that isn't thought of um, as commonly? Where do you think the root of the lack of awareness comes from? Because advisors obviously want to work with clients. They want to manage their money. They like to have deeper relationships with them. W- where do you see that, that gap or where do you see that, that disconnect that's meaning it doesn't have as much awareness as a lot of other products? Yeah, that's a great question. And really, the awareness is across the board. Funny enough, but as we go to advisor meetings and we attend conferences, we talk about this SDBA opportunity. And generally speaking, the first reaction we get is, no way, you can't do that. (laughs) Advisors have been told their entire career, you can get involved with a client's assets 
either during separation of service or retirement. When that asset rolls over into an IRA, that is when you can start working with your client's assets. And so we're coming in and we're shifting the paradigm. We're telling them, actually, you can get involved today. And again, we think when clients need help the most. And so the awareness starts at the advisor level. And again, traveling all over the place and attending all of these conferences and advisor meetings, it is surprising that so many advisors still don't know that this option is available. And we very much consider it both a privilege and a responsibility to raise that awareness because once we can raise the awareness with advisors, then they can raise awareness with their clients. And so we love that, you know, we have a really cool story to share and that wherever we're shouting our stories from the rooftop, that generally speaking, people are really excited because it presents an opportunity to now tell their client clients, excuse me, um, hey, remember that account that you asked me about last year? I think I can now help you. That's cool. Yeah. And and what about, um, it's interesting too that only 40% of employers um, offer it. Um, Do you all try and raise awareness with employers as well on why it's a great benefit to offer that to their employees or or, um, is, is that part of the awareness campaign? That's part of the awareness campaign, but really when record keepers are designing plans, it really is up to the plan participant to say, hey, Mm -hmm. I heard about this self-directed brokerage account option and I'd like it added for this reason. And so raising awareness with clients and with advisors that somehow over time that that message reaches the record keeper where that option can be added. And we've seen it done many times and we continue to see plans add SDBA every single day. That's cool. And so just back to that uh, other question that I wanted to be explicit on. So if, if somebody takes and, and goes down the SDBA route at early stage, okay, fine, they can do that. If they click another option, can they transition back into one? Like how, how does that work? And do you yeah. think that's another area of awareness that could be built? Um, is it like kind of a path and you're on it or, or do you have the ability to change paths kind of midway? always have the ability to change paths. The way that a self-directed brokerage account option works operationally is that it must be opened or activated inside of that 401k account. So once it's opened or activated, it needs to be funded so that they can invest in that other universe of investment options. But once it's opened, it a simple way to think about it is opening up a savings account alongside a checking account. Mm-hmm. You can move assets from the checking account to the savings account and vice versa, but all of those assets stay under that household. And SDBA, in conjunction with the core account, works in a similar way. So if a client were to have just the core investment options and say, hey, I'd like to pivot and work with my financial advisor on my SDBA, they can absolutely open that up, get it funded, and receive the assistance from their financial advisor on that portion of the assets. And the same goes true vice versa, that if they want to move assets back into the core account, that they can easily do so. That's good to know that it's not kind of a a shift or a decision that you make early on, almost like picking your major and then wanting to bail. (laughs) (laughs) Which did happen to me in college. Three years of (laughs) pre-med, only to pivot my senior year. (laughs) Seems to have worked out, I think. (laughs) (laughs) I think it was a good choice. And really, OCHEM didn't give me a lot of options. So (laughs) (laughs) totally, it all worked out. (laughs) That's awesome. So when when you're talking self-directed and it goes to the mechanics, the advisor can provide advice on it. Does the client have to actually click the buttons and manage it or can it actually be completely outsourced to an advisor? It can be completely outsourced to an advisor that partners with the Pacific Financial Group. The client, when they decide, hey, I want to work with my personal financial advisor to get the professional advice that I want and need, what they do is with any other asset that the financial advisor is managing for that client, they're saying, I want you to do it because you have years of experience, because you know how to do this, because you know how to coordinate this asset with the rest of the planning that you're doing for me. The way that the Pacific Financial Group comes into the equation is that we have partnered with, again, some of the largest asset managers in this country so that we provide a wide range of investments that vary depending on style of management, style of investments, and also, most importantly, risk tolerance. 
And so for the client that chooses to work with their financial advisor, they are opening up more choice, greater flexibility, but really that customized advice and solution and management that they so want and need. Yeah, I think there's a huge amount of benefit to clients who have confidence in their financial advisor. And you can imagine with retirement, if you've got your advisor you're working with and you kind of have this retirement account floating out over here that is it's just a line of paper or doesn't have that same depth and context that an advisor can bring to you and to the decisions you want to make for your own financial goals, then you can imagine it's going to be a much more worse experience, I'd say, um, than being able to, to feel like you have control over everything. Um, so it seems like a really huge benefit for both the advisor being able to get access to manage more um, assets, develop the relationship, um, be relied on, uh, and also be able to plan around it too. If you think about going through a plan, you don't necessarily know what's going on or you don't know quite as much about the assets that are in that 401k that the person has. Um, this allows for a lot more control. So it makes a ton of sense, I think, the way we think about it. The more context, the more education the advisor can do, the more confidence the client can get, the happier they're going to be, the less anxiety they're going to have around their financial future, which is a huge goal yes. um, for us. And a lot of what this podcast is about, too, is trying to educate people about it. Yeah, no, I totally agree with you. Again, going back to the financial advisor and the importance that the financial advisor, their role in having clients get to retirement on time and with enough money cannot be understated. I think it's more important than ever that clients work with a financial advisor. The need is great. There was a study that was recently done by Vestwell where they surveyed a number of small business owners and their employees. And the results were that 90% of those surveyed wanted access to professional financial advice to help them navigate their financial options. There was also a study that was done by the Investment Company Institute where they suggested that 60 million plan participants wanted advice. And so we know that the need is great. We also know that right now people need help, that 70% of baby boomers have $300,000 in assets or less. And to me, that's terrifying when I think about that number and what that means to the future of these people that have worked so hard and uh, done their best to get to retirement. But what we also know is that when a client works with an advisor, that they're so much better off than when they do it on their own. There have been plenty of studies done that have shown what the value of an advisor is. Vanguard suggests that the advisor alpha is somewhere around 3%. Russell Investments, in their 2023 study, they actually suggested it's closer to 5%. And they broke that down into four different categories. A, for active rebalancing. B, for behavioral coaching. C, for uh, custom planning and experience. And T, for tax smart planning and investments. And when you put that all together, I, for a D. <laughs> I, know, I wanted to throw you for a loop. You're like, wait, A, B, C, <laughs> wait, T, wait, wait. <laughs> hang on a second. But what we know is that when a client receives help from an advisor, that they're way better off. And the way that I like to think about it is if I were to build a house, I could watch some videos on YouTube. I could watch some TikTok videos. I could ask some friends and family. I could consult with the hot dot chat GPT. Yeah. <laughs> and I could probably figure out how to lay a foundation, get the wiring put in, get the plumbing put in, put up the drywall. Or I could work with a professional contractor who does just this thing and has years of experience. And if I were to build my own home, I could probably live in it. I'd probably be terrified mm. every single day. Yeah. And uh, my biggest concern would be weathering the storm. But if I lived in a home that was built by a professional contractor, I know that I'd have a whole lot more confidence. And I think about the financial journey in the same way, that if you work with a financial professional, again, someone who does this one thing and has been doing it for years, they're going to help you lay that foundation, get the wiring in just right, help make sure that the plumbing is in correctly put up the drywall so that every single day you feel a little bit safer in that home and that come storms that you'll feel a lot more confident weathering it. Yeah, that makes sense. And you and your team are like, you know, out across the U.S. meeting with advisors. Um, so when you meet a new advisor um, that doesn't know about this, like w w what's the process for them or how do they get ramped up or how, how do you work with them to start 
working with their clients on, on um, SPBAs. <laughs> on the SDBAs. SDBAs. <laughs> you know what? There are a lot of letters in there yeah, and I get them I jumbled know, up too. So I totally get it. When working with a new advisor, we want to, first of all, get them really comfortable with what this is. It's okay. new. It's different. We want to make sure that they understand it and that they also understand what this means for their client and what this also means for their business. And so we want to get them really comfortable with the Pacific Financial Group. Mm -hmm the offerings of our solutions, get them comfortable with the process because navigating the SDBA market is a little bit trickier than a typical account setup. So we want to make sure that they're comfortable with all of that. But once that happens, we really want advisors to look through their existing book of clients. And the reason being is that for these clients, they've had to tell them, I can't help you. Yep. So go back through your existing clients. And again, this is where I think the greatest opportunity is, is helping their existing clients yeah. on an asset that they've been asked previously right. if they can help on. So divide your clients into two piles, those that are working and contributing to an employer-sponsored retirement account and those that are not. For the ones that are working and contributing to an employer-sponsored retirement account, check with our regional sales consultants and see if it's a plan that offers an SDBA and then we will get you every single thing that you need to make sure that that account gets set up in the right way. And more than that, we want to also empower advisors by uh, giving them tools yeah. to help them in the process, which includes working with Cap Intel and <laughs> <laughs> making sure that they have the presentation tools that they need to make this whole process a little bit more understandable and the investments make a lot more sense. Yeah, that's cool. The Great Wealth Transfer has kind of already begun, um, I think, by, by for all intents and purposes. It's not the great wave yet that I think everybody's expecting. Um, but as you've got an aging population, you have more people who are losing their ability to manage their money and transferring a lot earlier than you necessarily think would be the case. Thinking about that, have you seen an uptick in the growth of SDBAs um, in general or has there been kind of an accelerated growth recently just as this is happening more? Because to me, it seems entirely evident that an advisor who's critical to the, a baby boomer, let's say, for example, and who's been able to build a broad relationship with good coverage um, and enough to be able to talk to the um, inheritors or the, the children of the, the boomer um, are going to be really well positioned to maintain that relationship after the wealth is transferred after the um, responsibility as well has transferred. So are you seeing people start to get more wise to this as that pressure is happening, as more money is transferring, and people are seeing it as a defensive play to say, I can maintain my, my client relationships better if I have a broader relationship? Um, do you see them not correlated yet? I feel like with the wealth transfer, this will have a big impact, but I'd love to get your take on that. Yeah, I think there is a correlation between the aging population but more so in the ability to work with the children of the aging population. So we see a lot of advisors that are doing full financial planning for the entire family. Bring in your children. Let's see how we can help them. And to the extent that you can build that trust early by helping them with their retirement account in their early years, that when that wealth transfer does happen, that they're much better positioned and that it becomes a much stickier asset. So in terms of strategy, it really is more holistic planning for the continuity of yeah. the business. But I think also that advisors recognize that there is a real opportunity to get involved with the children's assets early on. So that way, when that wealth transfer does happen, that there's a greater opportunity and chance that those assets stay with the advisor. Yeah, because you have a pretty high probability right now that a boomer's children are going to be working, working right? and are probably working yeah. uh, long enough to have started to build that 401k in a, in a, in a um, company that sponsors one. And so you can imagine it'd be a, a really good strategy yeah. from, from that perspective. No, and I love that, James, because I think the other cool thing about SDBA and giving advisors the ability to work with this asset is that you see financial planning happening a lot younger for a younger demographic. And the reason why that's important is for a variety of reasons. But I recently saw a study that said of college students, 41% don't know what an I, uh, 401k is. Mm. And 32% don't know the difference between a credit card and a debit card. And to me, that's 
terrifying because these are the young people that we will release out to the world and say, hey, start planning for your retirement. So the SDBA really gives an opportunity for financial advisors to work with these younger clients that don't have much investable assets outside of what's in their employer-sponsored retirement plan. Typically for an advisor, uh, I don't know if you all have mailings, but you'll get the mailings when you're about 55 to join this dinner where you can learn about what to do with your uh, retirement assets. But an advisor can now go to, uh, we like to call them Henry's, high earners, not rich yet, but they've got a lot of assets stored up in their 401k and they don't know what to do with it. So I like that advisors can now get started a lot earlier with clients and set them up for a better probability of a successful retirement. Have you seen with, I, I actually, I'll ask a different question. When it comes to the available assets that you can invest in with an SDBA, um, can you compare and contrast them to a standard um, set of accounts, um, something that you'd be able to invest in? Like, I'd love to get, is there a different universe or different security types? How does that work? What's available to those, those, those people? It's oftentimes very similar. In an SDBA account, it opens up thousands of options. I would say in most cases, the only option that isn't available are options. <laughs> <laughs> but outside of that, you typically have the individual stocks, bonds, ETFs, and mutual funds. But the way that I like to think about an SDBA versus a brokerage account is that for someone who is managing on their own, they face the same challenges of managing something like that inside of a 401k. Most people don't know what they're doing. They don't have the time. They don't have the temperament. They don't have the knowledge or the ability to manage. And so just as an advisor would provide advice and, client, uh, advice and help on a brokerage account, the same holds true for an SDBA. Let me do this for you because, again, I've been doing this for a really long time, and this is the only thing that I do. And so in terms of what that investment universe looks like, very similar. But what the difference is, is that for an advisor to be able to provide that assistance on the SDBA, that really is the delta in terms of what doing it on your own looks like and what getting to retirement on time looks like. We've had a pretty volatile past three years um, from a market's perspective. What do you mean? From a many, many different <laughs> perspectives, uh, but certainly from markets. Have you seen a big shift in how people are investing for retirement or how they're managing SDBAs um, that, that's really occurred, especially recently? I mean, we've, we've, had, we've had the pandemic, we've had interest rates, we've had whiplash in the markets. I'd love to get your quick take on that. Sure. I think that investment behavior has largely stayed the same, but the biggest thing that it did is that it kind of woke people up. Holy cow, I don't know what I'm doing here. <laughs> when markets are just steadily going up, we all think we're pretty good at this. Yeah. And it's only when there's a big correction in the market that we think, hey, maybe I could use a little bit of help here. And so in this time of uncertainty and when things have kind of been flipped on its head, I think what it's really done is made people take a hard look and say, I really need some help. And so we see a lot more folks wanting to get the professional help because they understand that, you know, when markets go up, everyone is fine. It's when things start getting a little bit rocky that they need someone to say, hey, we've got a plan, this is our plan, and here's why we're doing what we're doing. Providing that reassurance, giving them the help that they need, the advice that they want, and really the peace of mind that they deserve. Are there, um, g given that y'all were, were trailblazers and are trailblazers in the space, is there um, continued innovation going on in S SDBAs, or is it you know, now much more focused on um, education? There will always be continuous innovation in SDBA. And the way that I like to think about the Pacific Financial yeah. Group specifically is that we're a very experienced yeah. startup. And what I mean by that <laughs> is that we've had to be innovators. In order to be a pioneer in this space, we've always had to kind of look at what's next and really kind of meet the market where it needs to be met. Over the last few years, we've gone from managing our own assets to partnering with, again, some of the largest asset managers in the country, bringing a turnkey asset management platform inside of an SDBA. And I think we are the only ones out there doing it, and that is really cool. But as we continue to grow, yeah. our goal has been and will always be to continue to innovate, to continue to open up access 
to in-plant advice, not to just advisors, but advisors to clients with the ultimate goal of increasing uh, better investor outcomes. Yeah. So innovation uh, is core to us. It is part of our DNA. It is part of something that we will always continue to look at and invest in. And part of our journey and part of our story of innovation absolutely includes Cap Intel. That's cool. Yeah, it's such an important option for people to have and yeah. to understand. That's cool. I thought that was a kind of a good, I think it was like a nice way we were kind of wrapping it. So what do you want me to say? <laughs> well, I think you got a softball with the pioneer on the frontier. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I did, you know, I looked up the word frontier and what's really cool about it is that it's the edge of the wilderness. And I just loved the idea of like that as your podcast theme, because it's like, that's what we're doing, right? We're constantly at the edge, pushing forward, always trying to get a little bit more into the wilderness, unafraid to be brave and to take those courageous steps. So anyway, I just wanted to let you know that I really dug the name yeah, of the, cool. the, the podcast. I think we can wrap it up there. Um, thank you so much for joining us. <laughs> I can't say it any better than that. I appreciate you coming. See you next time on The Frontier.